day we're gathered in your name calling out to you your glory like a fire awakening desire will burn our hearts with truth you're the reason we're here you're the reason we're singing open
Well, hi, friends. Welcome to uh, Virtual Church this morning. Uh, I'm glad you made time to be here and um, hope and pray that this is a great time for you to, to connect with God. I want to start with a rhetorical question. And I say rhetorical, I, I actually don't want you to talk about this question with uh, someone near you. Uh, and that's intentional. I'd probably make it harder to be fully honest. Um, but think for a second, uh, just to yourself, why are you here? Why did you get out your computer? Why did you get out your phone? Why did you pull up YouTube on TV and start streaming our service? There are probably a million other things you could be doing right now. Things that are important, things that need to be done, um, and yet you're not doing any of those right now. Uh, you are streaming this service, and the question I want you to think about is why? I'm sure for all of us, the answer to this question is a bit layered. Um, now, maybe your parents really value this, and so you're just sort of along for the ride. Um, maybe you like the music, and, and that's why you've sort of tuned in today. Maybe you have no idea. Uh, it's Sunday, and this is what you do um, on Sundays. And that's fine. There's really no right or wrong answer to this question. Uh, but deep down, and potentially so deep that, that we can't even put words to it, um, deep down, there is a desire in all of us to connect to God. That's really what we all want. We know there's more to life than eating and sleeping and working, and we believe God exists and that he's the creator and the sustainer of all that there is, and so we want to know him. We long to know him. We crave some kind of connection to him, and it's happened here before. We've experienced a connection uh, through a service like this. Maybe it was through something someone said, or it was through a passage of scripture that was read, or a lyric in a song. And so our hope is to connect to him again. That's ultimately deep down why each of us is here right now. God wants to connect with each of us, and we long to connect to him. The beatitude that we're going to focus on this morning um, speaks to this deep craving that we all have to connect to God. 
We're working our way through Jesus' most famous teaching, found in three chapters of the book of Matthew, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, uh, called the Sermon on the Mount. But we're not going very fast. (laughs) Instead of our goal being speed through this sermon, no, our goal has been to really understand what Jesus is saying to us. And this first section of the sermon, called the Beatitudes, uh, is where Jesus has these blessed are the, these eight sort of statements in rapid fire sequence. Um, each one of these statements is so profound that we have sort of slowed down as we've gotten into these things. And now um, we're dealing with each one sort of one by one. And today's Beatitude in Matthew 5, chapter 8, it speaks to this deep down desire that we have to connect to our Heavenly Father. Uh, here's what it says. It says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Now, obviously, we're going to have to unpack, uh, unpack this to understand what Jesus is saying to us and how it applies to us. But even a first reading of this sentence is enough to leave our mouths watering, isn't it? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Wait, what is it? I can see God? I can have that kind of connection to him? This one that I've been consciously and unconsciously trying to connect with for my whole life? That's the reason that we're all here right now, why I'm here, why you're there, is we want to connect to God. And this verse says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Please tell me more. So let's get into this verse, and let's do it by asking two very simple questions. Uh, You can use these questions to study any passage of Scripture to really help you understand what it's saying. The first is, what does it say? We, We start by sort of observing the passage. What words are used? What do these words mean by themselves? What do they mean when they're connected? Uh, What's, uh, how is everything being held together? So what does it say? But then we ask, Uh, The all-important question, what does it mean? And specifically, what does it mean for you and I today? The point of Bible study is not a history lesson. No, we're trying to hear from God and to connect to Him in a real, personal way. All right, so let's start by asking, what does this verse say? This verse has two parts. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. So let's start with the first part. Blessed are the pure in heart. And... um, Let's just talk about each of these significant words in this uh, statement. Blessed. We've talked about this word several times in the last few weeks. We won't spend a lot of time here, but it means happy. It means fortunate. It's the good life, the person who's to be congratulated. Uh, The people living in the way this verse describes are blessed. They're the ones who should be congratulated. They have picked a wise and a great way to live. And what is this wise and great way to live? Um, Blessed are the pure in heart. So pure in heart, let's talk about them separately and then we'll talk about what they mean when they're together. Uh, Pure, I I don't know what you think about when you hear the word pure. Um, I immediately think of something like prudish. I'm sure it's because of the culture we live in, but most people place this word pure within some sort of sexual context, um, to be pure sexually. And certainly it can be used this way. Uh, But this term is really much broader than that. Um, There are all kinds of contexts in which this word pure is used. In the New Testament, this word pure means clean or undefiled. So if you have clothes... Uh, that get really dirty, they get muddy and soiled, and then they get cleaned, um, this word is used. Uh, if, if you're talking about an army that has, has all of the malcontented soldiers and um, the ones who are complaining, those are all removed, the army that you're left with is pure. Um, this is a word that's used to describe wine that's um, not diluted with water. It was pure. Or it was used to talk about precious metals that have no alloys, that have no impurities. Uh, They were pure. It means having no mixture. So in the context of human behavior, to be pure means to be sincere. It means to have integrity, to be whole. There's no pretense. There's no ulterior motives. There's nothing mixed in you. 
What you see is what you get. You're clean. Now, this word heart, this word pure is taken to a whole new level when you put it in conjunction with this word heart. Uh, Pure in heart. When Jesus uses the word heart, he doesn't use it in the way Tony Bennett uses it when he says he left his heart in San Francisco. Nor does Jesus mean that half-pound, fleshy muscle thing that lives inside your and my chest. Um, In Scripture, it's a really fascinating study if you want to study it sometime, Uh, but the heart is the very core of who you are. It's like the control center of your being. Uh, The primary uh, use for heart today is uh, the emotional part of our experience. But in in Jewish and early Christian thought, the heart was all-inclusive. It it referred to everything internal about you. The heart, your heart is sort of the summation of all that you are. Now, what this means then is when you put pure and heart together is that the kind of purity, the kind of integrity, the the kind of cleanness that Jesus desires, that he calls blessed, it goes way beyond the external, the visible, the surface level stuff that other people can see. The kind of purity Jesus is calling us to is the kind that goes to the very center of our being. And it affects every aspect of our lives. It affects our thoughts. It affects our motives, our emotions, our decisions. Now, if you leave heart off of this verse and you just say, blessed are the pure, well, that was a statement that the people in Jesus' day could get behind. Blessed are those with a a squeaky clean exterior. Those were the ones to be celebrated those who could put on a show and convince others that they were holy and godly. The Pharisees were the best at this. They had rules upon rules to maintain their cleanness externally. And you won't find any other group that Jesus condemns more strongly than the Pharisees. I mean, it's really interesting. Jesus welcomes prostitutes. He he welcomes tax collectors But religious people who have this external layer of religiosity, but it doesn't penetrate into their hearts, he's got no room for that. What Jesus wants is purity. He wants cleanness. He wants sincerity in our hearts through and through. The other day we were at Jen's parents' house in Richardson and they have a beautiful tree in their backyard. I'm not sure exactly what kind of tree it is, Um, but it has these huge branches that almost come out horizontally. You've probably seen trees like this and the kids really loved playing in this tree. So a few months ago, I actually built a little tree fort in that tree. And uh, last couple weeks ago, I was in this tree fort and I was sort of looking around at the tree and I saw there's a little hole. And so I was sort of looking around And this tree that is beautiful on the outside is completely hollow on the inside. I mean, it's an amazing tree. It has these huge, strong branches, got this thick bark, and yet it has no core. Uh, It's going to come down eventually. (laughs) My only hope is that our kids aren't in it when it happens. Um, But this is the temptation for every Christian. I call it the image monster. We are so image conscious. We learn how to look the part, how to put on the mask and say the right things. But what's really going on in our hearts is the opposite. I'll give you an example from my own life, one that I'm not terribly proud of. Uh, It was about a week ago, I was on the phone with Dave Falk, one of our elders here. It was like 7.30 in the morning. Um, And so the kids are running around. Everybody's trying to get ready for the day. Uh, They were being way too loud and obnoxious, uh, especially while I'm trying to talk to Dave on the phone. So I'm doing my best to try to quiet them, which is not going so well. Um, All the while, I'm trying to talk to Dave, being completely calm and peaceful. We're talking about trusting the Lord and choosing obedience. And all the while, the kids are getting more and more on my nerves. (laughs) Um, 
Well, when Dave and I finally finish the conversation, I mean, I've had it. I immediately start yelling at the kids. I'm like, Nathan, Bryce, get over here. Um, Come here right now. And I realized in that moment that I hadn't yet ended the phone call. (laughs) And uh, so I hang up the phone quickly, but then I get a text from Dave about five minutes later, and and his text said this. It said, make sure you hang up before you switch into scolding parent mode, LOL. Busted. Completely busted. I had wanted to give off this image of this guy who's calm and peaceful and in control, starting off my morning full of faith, but it was a facade. It was phony. I was just like this tree. Had a great exterior, rotten on the inside. This image monster is a very real thing, and we all struggle with it. All of us, if we're honest, we pay a lot more attention to the external parts of us, the things others can see, than we do the internal parts of us. Uh, Sort of a silly example, but it makes the point. Uh, Let me ask you a question. Today, did you spend more time and energy getting your inside ready or your outside ready? Most of us, we probably took a shower, probably brushed our teeth, picked out our clothes. Uh, I guess if you're watching from home, maybe you're still watching in your PJs, I don't know. Uh, But most days, we, we stand in front of a mirror well, we, we, we fix our hair, we eat some sort of breakfast, we rush to get out the door before we're going to be in front of other people. And yet, how much time do we go in to preparing the inner parts of us? Uh, deciphering our motivations and our attitudes, our thoughts, kind of processing the conflict from the day before and what the Lord wants to teach us through that uh, even into today. It's a silly example, but it's really very real. And it's not just real for those of you sitting there and looking this way. It's real for those standing here and looking out that way. Far too often, I mean, my focus is, is my message organized properly? Is it clear? Is it relevant? Um, it, my focus is sort of on the structural external parts of what I'm doing when really I should spend a whole lot more time on my knees overhauling my motivations and the attitudes of my heart. Recently, it seems like we can't go much more than about a week before we hear of some other famous Christian leader who has failed completely morally. And oftentimes, it's really disgusting kind of stuff. And I'm sure you wonder, like I do, how in the world did that happen? That's the inevitable conclusion of this image monster going unchecked. When the external gets the priority and the internal is ignored and neglected day after day and year after year, the results are devastating. Jesus says that's not the good life. That sort of double life where you say one thing, but you think another, where you do an action, but your motives are completely different. That's not the good life. No, he says the good life is the person who's whole, the person who's real, who's honest, who's pure in heart. Let's talk about the second part briefly. He says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Now, when you first read this, this can seem like a theological can of worms. See God? I mean, there's a couple dozen places in the Old Testament that says what seems to be the opposite, that no one can see God and live. So what is Jesus promising here? Uh, As soon as you get into this, though, you realize this isn't as hard as it maybe sounds at first, because I don't think Jesus is referring to physical sight. Have you ever had a hard time understanding something, and then a teacher explains it to you, or a parent explains it to you, and then you say, Oh, I see. You're not talking about physical sight. See in English as well as in Greek can also mean understand or grasp or have a greater comprehension of someone or something. And that's what Jesus is saying here. This intimacy that with God that we long for, we crave to understand him more, to grasp what he's like, to connect to him. Jesus says that's available to those 
who are pure in heart. Let me see if I can explain it this way. You know how the light spectrum, uh, it's much broader than we can see. Uh, in fact, the visible part, the part that you and I can see with our eye, is only about 30% of the entire light spectrum. Um, there's x-rays and there's gamma rays and there's infrared rays, but yet the hu human eye can only detect about 30% of that. What Jesus is saying here is that when it comes to the character and nature of God, it's not your eyes that function. No, the instrument's your heart. It's our hearts that perceive and know God. Sometimes I think we make a false conclusion that because God is invisible, that he must be distant. But that's just not true. And it's the pure in heart that have the ability to understand and grasp and connect to God in the way that others do not. Now, maybe it helps to think about it this way. What you are determines what you see. I mean, think about that for a second. What you are determines what you see. So if you're a botanist and you're walking down the road, you are seeing way more about the flowers and plants than the average person, right? If your friend's an astronomer and you go outside with them, you're going to say, hey, look at the stars. But your friend is going to name them. Oh, that's Orion. That, that one's Saturn. It doesn't matter if you're an interior designer, a mechanic. What you are determines what you see. My sister and her family have been in town for the last couple weeks. And my sister's husband, Ryan, uh, he was in emergency management for his whole life. So what do you think he sees? Uh, he sees what could go wrong in any situation. I have way more of an idea of all the places my home is vulnerable than I ever did before. Um, what you see, deter or who you are, determines what you see. This is what Jesus is saying. He's saying who you are affects what you see. If your faith is only external, the outside looks good, but there's no sincerity. The core is hollow that's gonna affect how much you can connect to God. But if you're honest with yourself and others, if there's a wholeness to you, if there's a cleanness on the inside and on the outside, well, then you will know and connect to God in a way that isn't possible otherwise. That's what this verse says. Let's end by talking about what it means. We've got what it says. In order for us to connect to God, we need to be pure in heart. There needs to be a sincerity and a wholeness to our lives. Okay, that's what it says. But how does that happen? How do we live with this sort of cleanness at the heart level? The process is probably different than you might think. Um, the takeaway from this message isn't, okay, I need to be pure, I need to be clean in my heart. So, uh, externally and internally, so I'm gonna work really hard at sort of controlling the motivations and the attitudes of my heart. I'm gonna lace up my shoes a little tighter and I'm gonna work a little harder to be pure so that I can connect to God. Um, that's not wrong to want to be pure in our heart, but uh, if you've tried that at all, it doesn't work. And it sounds exhausting, doesn't it? The way in you and I become pure in our hearts so that we can grasp and connect to God at a deeper level is by taking the path of honesty and connecting to Jesus. It's a process, not a process of getting it right. No, but more, how do we handle when we don't? I think there's some steps involved. Step one, we admit when the image monster rears its head. Every single one of us is more image conscious than we realize. And so when that image monster emerges in our experience, we need to be honest and sort of call it what it is. I mean, this will happen when we say one thing because we know that's what we're supposed to say, but we deep down know we really think the opposite. Or I'm sure you've had the experience, you're talking with someone and you're giving off the impression that you're listening to them, but really all you're thinking about is what you're going to say next. Um, but you make it look like you're listening. 
Or how about when your thoughts and motives are totally sinful and yet no one else knows that because no one can see that stuff. As we become aware of these things, these are opportunities for us to be honest and acknowledge them. God, I'm not clean in my heart. No one else can see it, but I see it and I'm bringing it to you. I'm sure you've had this experience. You've opened up the fridge and immediately you know something's wrong. There is something rotten in there. Um, you know what I do in those situations? I close the fridge door, I get out the Windex, and I clean the entire outside of the fridge. And then sometimes, you know, I get out the wax, and I polish the outside of that fridge until it just shines. No one does that, right? Because that doesn't do anything. That doesn't fix anything. Because the next time you open the door, the rotten chicken's still going to be in there. No, be, becoming clean is always a deeper work, and it starts on the inside. The path to becoming pure in our hearts is being completely honest with ourselves and with God and admitting that, we, that we're not pure. The second step is to come to him for cleansing. Jesus didn't come for the healthy, but he came for the sick. So when we come to him, humbly admitting that we've sinned and we've fallen short, he welcomes us with loving arms and he purifies us. He purifies us so that we're whiter than snow. He removes our sin from us as far as the east is from the west. He takes out the rotten chicken from our lives and so that we can be clean. We can be whole once again. And then step three is we step out in wholeness, empowered by the Spirit. This is where we cooperate with the Spirit and we seek to live a life of purity both inside and out, not in our own power. No, we have a a new engine in our lives. The Spirit of God enables us to live a whole life, no longer divided. But because we still live in the flesh, because we have such a habit of sin and of self-centeredness and of prioritizing the external and not the internal, uh, we'll fail again but that's okay because we know where to go. We don't have to hide it. We don't have to polish up the outside. No, we run to our Savior. We admit it. We receive cleansing and we step out again in wholeness. This is how you and I become pure in heart. It's a process of uh, getting up and falling down. (laughs) Getting up and falling down. Getting up and falling down over and over and over again, but there's an honesty and a sincerity in it all. A couple days ago, I walked into the front room of our house uh, where we keep our piano, and uh, my 15-year-old niece, Jenna, was sitting at the piano playing a song I'd never heard before. Uh, It's called Clean. I walked up behind her, and I was reading the lyrics as she was playing and singing this song, and I was just sort of blown away. She had no idea what passage I had been studying all day, and yet the lyrics of this song put into words better than I could say in, in 20 minutes here. Uh, what Jesus offers us, that he's the one who can make us clean, who can make our hearts pure so that you and I can have what we've longed for our entire lives, a relationship with our Heavenly Father, an intimate connection with him. So I've actually asked my niece, Jenna, if she would uh, play this song uh, for us. So as you um, hear her, as you read these lyrics, uh, make this your prayer as well. Precious blood has left me forgiven Pure like the whitest of snow Powerful to make sin and shame retreat This covenant is making me whole So I will rise By his mercy, my life was spared. The highest name has set me free. Because of Jesus, my heart is clean. 
because of Jesus my heart is clean because of Jesus my heart is clean uh, please pray with me God I thank you that we don't have to have pretense with you. God, I thank you that um, what we are so used to doing, sort of living a double life, putting on different masks with different people, saying the right thing, Lord, that is exhausting, and we know that life all too well. And with you, we do not need to do that. You invite us to a totally different way to live where we can be honest, where we can come to you and say, man, I've blown it again. We can be who we are with you and you create a purity inside of us. Lord, we invite you to continue that work. Lord, would you reveal places in our own lives right now where we're just not being sincere. We're polishing up the, inside, the outside and leaving the inside untouched. Uh, God, it's really easy for us to see that in people who've fallen or Christian leaders who've gone astray. And yet, Lord, we admit that that's us too in much smaller ways right now. Uh, but Lord, we know if that doesn't get checked, if your spirit doesn't convict, if, if we don't repent and get back into a place of sincerity, uh, Lord, that'll be our path as well. Um, Lord, we do long to know you. Thank you that we can know you. And I thank you that we have a place we can go when we see that junk in our lives, when the, uh, when the inner parts of our life don't smell real good. We can come to you and, and receive your cleansing. Jesus, you make us pure in heart. We've got nowhere else to go. Thank you for... Uh, what you've done for us. We rejoice in his name.
Thanks for worshiping with us today. I hope something that was either said or scripture read, a lyric in a song, something sort of touched you. And, and maybe sometime today or this week, I sort of sit with that and ask, God, what are you wanting to say to me right now? Uh, if uh, another way we worship is through giving, and uh, you'll see a link in the description below of how to give online and support uh, the ministry that's happening in and through uh, this church. Uh, coming up in this next week, uh, the youth are going to meet up here at the church this Wednesday night. They've been meeting in homes this Wednesday night. They'll be meeting up here. Um, and then this coming Saturday um, on the 31st, they're going to have an outdoor movie night. That's for students, but but for anybody. I think it's at eight o'clock. Um, and so you'll hear more about that as well. Uh, the, I just also want to take a second and talk about the plan moving forward. Uh, we're going to continue to meet outside on Sunday morning and continue to have this online platform as well. Um, uh, we're going to meet outside as long as possible until it gets way too cold to stand, uh, to stand it out there. Um, we have some thresholds in place where if the, the numbers rise of COVID cases that we we will make that a masked service. But right now we're doing masks in and out and we're sort of staying apart from each other um, and worshiping together in that way. So we're going to continue doing that. The Lord has given us great weather for a number of weeks in a row. So we've been grateful for that. And I'm really glad that we can continue offering uh, this online platform because so many of our people are connecting with us in this way. As always, if there's a way we can serve you, if we can pray for you, please reach out um, and we'd love to do that. Uh, thanks for being here. Um, God bless. <laughs>